Yes. Okay. You're good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Thank you all for being here. Um, I will talk about fixed points. This is quite a strange title, but I, I hope you will understand very shortly. And it will be about the ontological nature of measurement units. Um, this is a work in progress, as you will see in the metaphysics of quantities and of measurement, because it is scientifically based. The aim is to defend, uh, and I will define them later, absolutism against relationalism. Maybe I will uh, say uh, relationism, because it's shorter and easier to, to pronounce. Uh, and the method I will use is to try and draw uh, metaphysical conclusions from, at least partially, uh, measurement practices. And as you will see, I will focus on some unit definitions, and uh, mainly on standards, measurement standards, and mainly on the way that standards possess their magnitude or their quantities. And I will argue, this is the, the core of the following arguments, I will argue that standards need to be stable in order to have a meaningful measurement, and that this stability of standards implies uh, an absolutist view on quantities. This is the main uh, argument. So I will begin by uh, talking a bit about standards and what magnitudes are, and then on the need of fixed points, and on the third and fourth sections I will uh, display the main arguments. Okay. So you have here uh, some chosen definitions of units that you may know uh, already. Uh, I won't go through all of them, just I pick just maybe one or two. Here you have the formal definition of the metre, that is the unit of, of length, which was defined as the dis distance at zero degree between the axes of two central lines marked on the bar of platinum iridium who was kept at the BIPM uh, in France. So the metre is a distance from a material object. And um, yes, maybe this one today. No, this one. Second, uh, for a short period of time, the metre was defined as a multiple of uh, wavelength of the orange red emission line in the electromagnetic spectrum of the krypton atom. So, the first question is, what are those terms that I refer to, those uh, lengths here, the distance between two axes and a multiple of web wavelengths? What are these uh, things that I am referring to? Just to settle some technical terms, uh, I'm calling quantities the determinable kinds of quantity, like mass or length, and I'm calling magnitudes the determinate quantities that uh, objects may possess. Like having a mass of 3 kilos, being 10 meters long, and so on. So, um, a measurement unit, this is an assumption, which could be criticized, uh, of course, a measurement unit is the magnitude, the magnitude of a quantity. So when you want to measure uh, some quantities like x, you have to choose a unit, and the unit is a uh, little x, a uh, determinate magnitude of the quantity x. But units, as you know already, have to be realized that the uh, not technical term, that is, they have to be possessed by concrete and manipulable and variable standards uh, so that measurement systems can be established, or what is called mise en pratique in the technical uh, vocabulary. For instance, uh, until 2018, the unit of mass, that is a specific mass magnitude, was the mass of an object, which was called the EPK, International Prototype of the Kilogram. So, my question now is, what is the ontological nature 
of such magnitudes that are defined and identified as measurement units. That is, what is it for a concrete object, because standards are always concrete objects, what is it for them to possess this magnitude of a quantity? Well, as answers, we have competing metaphysical views. The one that I will be criticized that, that I will criticize here is called relational, relationalism, uh, according to which quantities are only relations among concrete objects. That's all you have in, in, in the world. So there are no absolute mass magnitude. Objects just don't possess absolutely their, their magnitudes. So either they just don't exist or when objects are, they have magnitude, they are grounded in uh, more fundamental facts that are relational. Okay? So, for, for instance, my laptop, which is said to, to weight uh, one kilogram and uh, 300 grams, yes, grams. Uh, well, what is it for my laptop to have this mass? It is only, according to relationism, it is only, or at least fundamentally, to be in certain mass relations with other objects. For instance, to be as massive as another, uh, to be uh, two times as massive as, and so on and so on. <coughs> so all you have are just objects which stand in certain determinate mass relations. Okay? On the contrary, you have absolutism, which claims that quantities are uh, ranges of absolute magnitudes. So, of course, absolute magnitudes exist, and they are what's fundamental. the ground mass relations. So, uh, to take the same example, my laptop has its mass in an absolute manner, and only later, only on a grounded level, it can stand in determinate relations. So it's only because it has its mass, and that my car, on its part, has also its mass, that the, the, the two stand in uh, their relation, okay? So, my goal is to give, I hope, good reasons to reject relationalism, and to defend only a basic absolutist claim that objects possess their magnitudes absolutely, and not in a relational way. But I won't uh, commit to any more specific absolutist views, like the one I put here. I don't know yet if, uh, if quantities or magnitudes are absolute, intrinsic, monadic properties of objects. I don't know if we should supplement uh, them with uh, second order relations, just to put some structure on them, and so on. I don't know if Wolf is right um, with her structural substantivalism, and so on. I don't know. I just want to prove, if I, uh, I hope so, to prove that objects possess magnitude in an absolute manner, and not fundamentally by entering in some relations. But while focusing, as I do, on standards, on measurement standards, because they have a very special feature that will be of interest, they have to be fixed points. And this is a very special characteristic that will allow me to, to draw some metaphysical conclusion, I hope. What are fixed points? I will uh, explain it uh, uh, more extensively later, but it's just the fact that when you do measurements, when you measure things, you have to assume that your standard is a stable realization of the unit you have chosen. And my main argument, or the, the common form of the following arguments, will be that this stability of the standard cannot be understood from a relational point of view. You have to be absolutist to, to, to give some sense of uh, stability. And because standards are just conventionally cho chosen, 
they are nothing uh, specific or privileged or particular about standards, except that they are used as such. Uh, well, this conclusion about standard will, I hope, extend to any object. So this is just a special case which has nothing special, actually. Um, so, what are fixed points? Well, basically, when you, when you want to measure a quantity like mass, I will take mass as a, uh, an example throughout the whole speech. Uh, when you want to, to measure mass, you have to coordinate uh, numbers with objects. And there, this requires lots of assumptions, but I will only present three. So there is three steps in coordination. First, you have to choose a scaling convention. Then you have to produce standards that fit uh, this, the chosen scaling. And then you, have to, you further have to make a stability postulate that could be uh, important to you. So I will go quickly on this because it's uh, well known. The scaling convention is the fact that you have to choose a and target a specific magnitude of mass as your unit, your, your unit. And traditionally, this magnitude will be associated or attributed to the number one. But actually, there is nothing uh, necessary here. You could choose a unit and say that your unit is two. Yeah. Uh, this is conventional, of course, because any mass magnitude could be chosen as the unit. Uh, and this convention actually captures what's uh, unit dependent and not objective in your measurement results. Everything else must remain uh, equivalent when you change your unit. Um, of course, here I speak of mass, but when you consider uh, other quantities, maybe like temperature or density, I don't know, uh, that is quantity that have a less rich structure, they are not additive, basically. Uh, you may need more than just one point of coordination. You may choose maybe two units, that's bizarre to talk about two units, but that's basically uh, this. For temperature, you have to uh, choose the boiling point. That's not an obligation, but traditionally you choose the boiling point of water and the freezing point of water. You attribute them two numbers, like 100 and 0, and then you can coordinate your numbers with the temperature states. Okay, then once you have defined your unit, you still have to produce objects that realize this this is the a term that I don't want to interpret too strongly but that realize the unit this is what's called the mise en pratique for example uh, with the old kilogram well the standardization is straightforward because the old kilogram was defined as the mass of this object so automatically the following standard is this object. Um, I've put um, an image here. Here you have the EDK, which is well protected, with <laughs> <laughs> three layers of glass, and only touch know, maybe every 40 years, so this is a very stable standard, I hope. Um, but with the new kilogram, which has very recently been defined, uh, I will come back to it later, by fixing the value of the Planck's constant. Uh, well, that doesn't give you automatically your standard, so you have to produce using Kibble balances, or Watt balances, I will come back to it later. You have to produce a body whose mass is exactly the, the unit that you have targeted in your definition. 
And then this standard, and when I, when, I, uh, when I say standard, I will always assume that I'm speaking of primary standards and not secondary or copies of replicas and so on. When, once you have your standard, well, you can manipulate it and you can calibrate your uh, measurement instruments and, and so on. But you also need to make uh, a postulate, something that I call the postulate of fixity, because this standard needs to be a fixed point. A fixed point. That is, you have to assume that it is not, uh, at the moment of you, of you producing it, it's not only at this moment a uh, realization of the defined unit, but that it will stay, it will stay uh, as such. It will be stable. It will keep on having the same unit, the same magnitude that you define as the unit. For instance, uh, the EPK not only possesses the kilogram, the mass of one kilogram, in uh, 1899 when it was manufactured, but later on it has to be stable to to uh, allow for meaningful measurement. I will come to, to it. So, three questions now: Why? Why this postulate? How do we make sure of it, if we can? And what is it precisely, this postulate? Or what it is not, more precisely. So basically, why do we need uh, to make this uh, postulate of fixity? What do, do we need fixed points? Because, as I said, we need to assume that when we use the same object as a standard for a period of time, we need to assume that uh, our different and successive measurements will be uh, coherent and will be meaningful. Suppose, for instance, that you use this uh, wooden log as the prototype, as a standard. So at, at T0, you define it as a mass standard, so you define your unit as the mass of this. But uh, at a later time, it has maybe swollen with moisture, or maybe it has gained mass because of, I know, some kind of pollution. But later on, maybe you have damaged it, or you have used it too, mu too much, so it has uh, lost a bit of mass. But while using it, you are also making measurements with it, by comparing other, uh, other objects to it. But if its mass has changed in, during the time, in the interval, well, you, your measurements result won't be uh, meaningful. I will take an example later. No. Well, suppose for instance that you, you measure how you wait just before Christmas using this. And then after Christmas, you, you wait yourself and you, const you, you see that you have uh, maybe lost some weight, which is very surprising. But you cannot be sure if you don't make this uh, postulate that this is not, that this was maybe gained some weight. So you have to be sure of that. Otherwise, you could eat all the things you want and just compare yourself with something that always gains some mass. And you will see that, uh, and you will say that you have lost some weight, so it's not very honest. Um, so that's why, obviously, we don't use this as a standard, but something made of platinum iridium, which is an alloy very known for its stability under certain uh, storage conditions. Um, okay, but there is here a room for controversy because. Well, if you are a radical anti-realist, maybe you will retort that this postulate of fixity is actually included in the scaling convention. Because once you choose the unit and you realize it in an object, well, maybe it has no meaning, no empirical meaning to say that the standard is fixed or is stable. Because basically, as Dinger or Wittgenstein uh, pointed out already, 
this is something that you cannot, strictly speaking, verify empirically. Because any kind of measurement of mass that you do is by comparing objects to the EPK. So you cannot compare the EPK to itself, so you cannot measure and check its mass. So maybe the postulate of fixity is just a convention and has no empirical meaning. But I will do here a minimal realist assumption, which I think is quite fair, only that uh, objects, massive objects, like the EPK, have mass magnitude. They do have mass magnitude independently of our uh, choice of convention, our uh, measurement practice, and so on. So, this implies that the postulate of fixity has an empirical status. It means so something about this object, about the world, even if it's not verifiable, empirically. Uh, another way to put this is to say that there is an objective di distinction between a change in, in the scale and a real change in the unit. I don't know if you see what I mean by that, but it's quite simple. You can, at any moment, rescale uh, by saying that, uh, um, well, you, you don't measure mass in kilogram anymore, but in the mass of these objects. I don't know. This is rescaling. But as long as it is said, known, and transparent, uh, this poses no, no problem. But if the object that you claim to use as the permanent standard actually changes in mass, then this is not a rescaling, this is a real change in mass. So if you, you, you think that there is an objective difference between the two, then the postulate of fixity has an empirical status even if it's not, not directly uh, checkable. But indirectly it is, and metrologists, as we will see, actually try and check that it is stable. Otherwise, they, they, they cannot do meaningful measurements. So this was about the why, now about the how. Um, there is a well-known epistemological challenge, and Chong puts it like this way, consider in the abstract the case <coughs> of someone who has com come up with a fixed point where none have yet been established. That, that is not so different from the, the, the flight of a being who is hurled into interstellar space and asked to identify what is at rest. In order to tell whether something is fixed, one needs something else that is known to be fixed and can serve as a criterion of judgment. But how can one find that first fixed point? So this is the well-known uh, problem of circularity that, that I want to unfold here. But this problem actually comes from the fact that the predicate fixed, or stable if you want, is actually a relative, uh, relational predicate. It's only relative to something else that you first, uh, on first hand assume to be fixed, that you can judge and check and measure if something is or not fixed. But, as you may hear, I used the term fixed twice in this sentence. First, as something that you can check empirically. Well, do I change in weight during the holidays? And second, as something that you have to assume in order to make that kind of checks and measurements. So you have to assume, even if it's not empirically ver verifiable, you have to assume that your standard is fixed. Well, <laughs> this is a childhood uh, reading. We are in the lunar rocket. I don't know if you remember, it's on Explorer of the Moon. Uh, Tintin is about to restart the, the, the engine and <laughs> said, hang on. And uh, Dupont, Thompson, Thompson. Yeah, in English, it's Thompson. Right? Thompson, yeah, Thompson's brother. Carry on. We all we, we are holding tight. And later, it's funny. There are bruises and, and so on. We are done very tight. But to what? This is Wolf, not uh, 
Uh, Joe Golf, but uh, so I think you skipped the joke about the whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> At one point, uh, a dog fell, fell on the floor and, and the, the bottle of whiskey on his face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there is a circularity, which is a very important epistemological problem. Maybe there is no real way out, uh, except that we could always make uh, intercomparison procedure to, to check that your standard, if it's not absolutely fixed, because you cannot check that at least is uh, uh, stable relative to other admitted points of reference. But it remains the risk of a common drift. Maybe all your reference points are drifting in the same direction uh, together. You could also construct a hierarchy of standards. This is the case with the kilogram, the old kilogram. Um, it was actually very protected into two layers of glass. And uh, we only manipulated its six official replicas or official copies. It's also the, the case for the time. Uh, if you read Erantal, uh, he explains that we have a, a very huge hierarchy of standards to construct what we call the universal time, UTC. You could also build models to understand uh, what are the factors that, that could uh, influence the stability or the instability of your uh, standard to make corrections. And finally, what? What is or what is not this uh, postulate? Well, we should not conflate it with the metric convention, although sometimes in some cases that both are uh, identified. For instance, uh, in the current definition of the second, it is defined as a fixed number of period of uh, radiation corresponding to hyperfine transition of cesium 133. But this definition implicitly, as Tal says, specifies a metric convention for time, namely that any two periods of the radiation are equal. So this is a metric convention because it tells you uh, why or which intervals are considered equal. But as you see, it also specifies that the standard, the, the second, is stable over time. So maybe in this case, there is a confusion or an identification between the metric convention on one hand and the postulate of fixity on the other. But uh, from a conceptual point of view, both are really distinct, for instance, with the IPK, IPK, IPK sorry. Uh, the two are clearly distinct because when you postulate that its mass is stable, that it is really stable thanks to the kind of alloy that you used, uh, it has strictly no implication as to what counts as uh, an addition of mass and so on, or intervals of mass. Okay. Oh yeah, and also make sure that you you don't say that what is fixed is the unit itself. It makes actually no sense to say to, to say that uh, the kilogram is fixed because the kilogram is the magnitude, and magnitude is not what it is about. I mean, this is not what could change. What could change in mass is the standard and the object itself, that which possess magnitude. Okay. It's like saying that uh, points in space are moving. That's bodies who can move in space, that is, change uh, the points that they occupy successively, but points in space are not moving. Well. Now, uh, 
My question is, what does it mean for a mass standard to be stable? If you are a relationist, you say that this stability consists in the fact that the standard holds the same mass relations to other massive objects. You have no choice but to analyze the stability as a relational fact. If you are an absolutist, you simply say, say that uh, the stability is the fact that it keeps the same absolute magnitude of mass. Just, it has the same mass, intrinsically. Okay. Um, well, on the next section I will speak exten extensively on this, uh, about this uh, relationist answer, and then if I have uh, enough time, I will talk, uh, I will ask if my arguments uh, must be replaced or complemented if we uh, go from the token-based definition, the kilogram is the mass of this subject, to uh, units that are defined uh, with reference to laws or constants of nature and so on. Maybe that actually doesn't change anything. Maybe it does. I hope it does because the arguments are quite nice uh, after all. Uh, well, token-based units. This is a, a name given by Hantal, so it's not mine. Um, well, you know them. The unit of mass is the magnitude of this object. The unit of length is the length of this object, and so on. And automatically, as I said, the, de the designated objects serve as standards, primary standard. I will display four arguments, if I have time. Um, two are based on measurement practices, and two are purely metaphysical uh, arguments. First argument. It's based on, based on the fact that we not only measure masses of objects, but we also track uh, how objects lose or gain in mass. So suppose we track the mass of an object x over time, relative, obviously, to the mass of the IPK. And it ends up in statements like the mass of x is k kilogram less massive as it was before. Suppose it. I claim that to be meaningful, this kind of statement actually requires that the mass of the EPK be absolutely fixed, not relationally fixed, or that its fixity must be understood in an absolutist uh, way. So, for that, you use the EPK as the, the standard and you want to track the evolution in mass of this object. So, uh, you first compare, suppose you are in uh, uh, 1899, you compare your log to the IPK and you find that your log is exactly one kilogram. So, the log is in the relation as massive as the IPK. But 20 years later, you compare it again and the result is 0.9 kilogram. So your uh, naive conclusion would be that the log has lost weight, lost mass. It's now less mass than it was before. Well, me, this is me, the naive, uh, naive uh, metrologue. But obviously and immediately, the relationist will retort to me that I'm wrong and that my measurement only mean, means that uh, what has changed is the mass relation, not the mass of the measured object, because there are no, no absolute magnitude. So I cannot, strictly speaking, speak of the evolution of the absolute magnitude of the wooden log. But I will answer that okay, but it is the log that has lost in mass, not the EPK that has gained in mass during the interval. So maybe uh, we, we end up only measuring a new relation. I compare the log to the IPK, and the relation is now 
Okay? But what I want to measure is the mass of W and not the mass of the IDK. But obviously the relationist will answer that there is no difference between the two situations. If you admit only relations, mass relation, you cannot make any difference between the two situations where in one it is uh, the W who has lost in mass and on the other hand it is the IDK which has gained in mass. You cannot just do this, this make this difference because there are no absolute magnitude. So, to answer the relationist, this is the first version of the argument. Okay, but the change in mass is actually measured in kilogram, in a specific unit. So, this means that even 20 years later, when I say that uh, there is a change in relation, a change of 0.1 kilogram, when I say this to be meaningful, I have to assume that, that during the interval, the kilogram itself hasn't changed. Otherwise, I couldn't uh, measure meaningfully the difference uh, in the interval. So, yeah. so this is just the postulate of fixity. This is nothing new compared to what I said before. But the crux of the argument here is that the IPK stability cannot consist in a relational stability because the, re the mass relation has changed in the interval. So if you are a relationist, you said, OK, I have to postulate that my standard is fixed, is stable. But if you are a relationist, this fixity could only consist in the fact that it keeps the same relation. But you have actually measured that the relation has changed. So you cannot, uh, at the same time, measure change in mass relative to the IPK and be a relationist about the fixity of the standard. Okay. I don't know if this, the argument is sound or not, but I hope so. So my conclusion is absolutist. I think that we have to assume that the fixity of the standard means that it keeps the same absolute magnitude and not that it keeps the same mass relation because otherwise we wouldn't be able to measure change on the non-change, you see. Can, I, don't, I don't want to discuss, but could you just repeat what it means to be the postulate of fixity for the relationist? Um, yep. Well, uh, no, with no regard to the metaphysical position you choose, to be stable as a mass standard is to keep the same mass. But depending on what your option is, you analyze uh, differently what the same mass is. If you are a relationist, having the same mass is to keep the same mass relations. Mm. Okay. But you cannot keep the same mass relations if what you measure actually is a change in the relations. Okay. So the stability can only be absolute. Um, I'll skip the objections and responses. Maybe you will come to that in the Q&A. Okay, so my conclusion for this first argument is that if you are a relationist, you assume that the IPK is fixed, that is that it keeps the same mass relations to all other massive objects. So if you are, if you think that either the IPK is indeed relationally, relationally fixed, but then you can measure no mass variations and you Assume that you are in, a, in some sort of aleatic world where, no, where nothing actually changes, or you assume, as we can see everywhere when you look around, that there are mass variations and they can be meaningfully measured. So 
the stability of the IPK must be understood independently of its mass relations, that is, in an absolute manner. Uh, okay. Second argument. There may be a way out for the relationist here, because you could say that the stability of the IPK consists, consists sorry, in this specific relation that the IPK 20 years later is as massive as it was uh, when it was created. So maybe the stability of the standard could be relationally understood through uh, an, some sort of intertemporal relation like this. A relation as massive as between the same object but at two different times. Um, and it's good because actually metrologists are trying to check and see whether the IPK is indeed stable or not. So actually these kind of comparisons between the IPK now, its mass now, and the mass it, has, it had before, could be not directly measurable, but could be uh, through model constructing and so on, uh, empirically checkable. So here I've, I've put uh, a quotation from a series of metrologists in a very famous article, Redefinition of the Kilogram, a decision whose time has come. They were pushing for uh, shifting to a, a Planck's constant definition of the kilogram. The IPK, they say, can be damaged or even destroyed. It collects dirt from the ambient atmosphere and must be carefully washed in a prescribed way prior, prior to its use. It cannot be used routinely for fear of wear and damage. And it seems that its mass, this is very strange actually as a sentence, its, its mass may be, may be changing with time with respect to the ensemble of PTER standards of about the same age, perhaps, uh, 50 micrograms per century. We cannot be certain of this, obviously, because we cannot compare the IPK to itself, and this would be the, the only way to be sure of this. Um, but when I, I haven't put here the, the diagrams, but when you see the diagrams from the intercomparison, there were uh, three main intercomparisons in, in a century, and you see that the IPK is drifting away from its copies. That's really weird, and we actually didn't understand why. And in the last intercomparison, I think it was in 2010, something like that, the drift, the, the drift just stopped. So it, it didn't come back, but <laughs> just stayed. Uh, at this distance, that's really weird, and we don't know why. But we find those kind of statements that say the standards have drifted off so many uh, micrograms in a century. In a century. Again, my claim is that this kind of, state of statement, to be meaningful, imply or re requires that the mass of the IPK to be is an absolute magnitude and not a relation, in fact. Um, to prove it, I need uh, two premises. First, that the IPK is the only standard of the kilogram. And actually, this is true in virtue of the token-based definition that I displayed earlier. We only have one primary standard of the kilogram, one, on, one and only realization of the kilogram. Otherwise, it would be simple. If you had two uh, mise en pratique or two realizations of the same unit, you could always very meaningfully compare one to the other and then check if it has varied or not. Premise B, the IPK is a persistent object, meaning that it is the same object as it was before or when it was created. It's important because, well, you will see. Although, obviously, its properties could change, its mass could change, even if we hope not. Okay. Now, 
I suppose that you have this kind of relation that the IPK is now x times less massive as it was 20 years or 100, 100 years ago. Here's my argument. argument. Um, first, this relation being x times less massive n can only be of second order. That is, it can only hold not between concrete object, that is first order relations, but between states or properties or relations of objects. Okay? And once I have uh, established that, well, I will say that the consequences for relationism is, uh, are very uh, bad. But this is the crux of, of the argument. Suppose that this relation is of first order. So its relata are concrete objects. What are they? What are its relata? It cannot be the IPK with another standard of mass, another realization of the kilogram, because it's the only one, famous A. It cannot be that the IPK is compared to itself, not because it wouldn't be uh, practically, practically feasible, but because when you say that the IPK is x times less massive as itself, it is just nonsense. An object can only be as massive as it is, and it is trivial. So you cannot say that. Or you could also try to consider that the IPK then and the IPK now are two distinct objects, and then you can have a non-trivial relation being as massive as or being x times less massive as. This would be non-trivial, but it is forbidden by the second premise. Because this is one and only object, the LPK, not two uh, time indexed uh, objects. So, the conclusion is here is that this is a second order relation and that its relata are the mass of the IPK before and the mass of the IPK now. This is not an absolutist conclusion as such. This is just uh, about the, statute, the status of this uh, relation. So now, su now, suppose that this relation is of second order. Uh, of course, there is an absolutist uh, possibility here. You can say that, yes, this relation relates the absolute mass of the IPK before and the absolute mass that it has now. But if you want to stick or to save re relationism here, you could say that No, it's not here that you should say this. Yeah. Okay. If you are a relationist, and if you say that the IPK has a different mass before and now has a new mass or a different mass, you should analyze this mass of the IPK before as a bundle of relations and also the mass that it has now as a bundle of relations to other massive objects. So, here my conclusion is that if you refuse absolutism here, you have to go back to my first argument. Because now it is again not possible to understand its pure stability when you measure other, other objects, to understand it in a relational way. So you actually go back to the first argument when you uh, postulated that its stability meant that it keeps the same mass relations with other objects. So, actually the two arguments are kind of uh, working together to make sure that if you are a relationist, you cannot at the same time uh, ground the fact that, that metrologists track and measure the change in mass of other objects and at the same time, try to check and measure the stability of the IPK itself. But they do both. So, if they do, relationism fails to account for, for this kind of measurement practice. Um, okay. Il est 15 heures. <laughs>
I'll be quicker on the two following agreements. This is a purely metaphysical, this one, uh, which I call the theoretical argument. It's not, maybe not a perfect name. Imagine, let's just suppose that the IPK is perfectly stable because it is made in a, uh, a, metal, <coughs> a metal alloy that is perfectly stable. Well, a bit like Epicurus gods who are material but not corruptible. Okay. But suppose also that we live in a world which is Cartesian, meaning that everything else changes. Every other mass is changes. So if you are an absolutist, well, it's good news, because you have uh, a perfect standard, a standard which is perfectly stable, and this matches your, your most, uh, your most uh, crazy dreams. But if you are, this is paradoxical, if you are a relationist, this is a nightmare, because even if the uh, IPK is in a perfect metal alloy, since its relations to all the other objects are constantly changing, you have to say that its mass is also constantly changing. So, th this is not an argument. This is just something to that struck me once, because uh, from an absolutist perspective, this is really good that you have a perfectly stable standard, but from a relationist view, this is a nightmare. But maybe the relationist move would be to say that, okay, we don't know if the IPK is actually stable or not, perfectly stable or not. But what we can do is to manufacture, I don't know, n official copies in the same alloy. And this is actually what the meteorologist did in the 20th century. And you can periodically compare one to each other to uh, to at least establish that they are relatively fixed one to another, even if there, there remains a possibility that there is a common drift, but you cannot uh, empirically assess this. This would be, as Chang would say, this would be perfectly sufficient to make mass measurements and to operationalize your concept of mass. Okay. So this I would call the, the class of the, the stability class solution uh, from the relationist. But now suppose that you manufacture a new copy of the IPK. So this means that the IPK gains a new mass relations with a, a new object that is included in your stability class or stability grid, right? And obviously, you, you won't say that because, strictly speaking, it don't has the same relations as before, because it has a new one. You won't say that, even if you are a relationist, you won't say that its mass has changed. So, I draw from this that the relational stability of the IPK is indifferent to the number of its stable relation, as long as the, re the relations that it has are stable, stays the same. First, uh, first part of the argument. Now, the same thing can be, can be done with the type of mass relation that it has. Suppose now that uh, in your stability grid, in your equivalence class, if you, if you want, you add a standard for the milligram now because for practical reason you need it. Well, now the IPK also gains a mass relation, being uh, 1,000 times as massive as this new object that you had. And obviously, for the same reasons, because it's purely practical, not, not ontologically it's meaningful, you won't say that the IPK, is before it gains, uh, because it gains a new relation, uh, would have change in mass. So the IPK is also stable, relationally stable, even if the type of its mass relation changes. 
So actually, if you are a relationist, you have to say that the IPK is stable as long as there is at least one object with, with which it has a stable relation. And no matter the number of these stable relations and the type, I mean the, the type of those stable relations. But the consequence is okay, interesting because there is actually nothing privileged about, about the objects that it has stable relations with. So it actually ends up being perfectly trivial because all you're saying when you say that all we need are uh, stability class in which we could make intercomparison procedure and so on, actually all you say is that the IPK is stable because it keeps the same relation with the object with which it has stable relation. So it's again completely trivial. Now, last argument uh, about material standards. It's from causal asymmetry. Uh, actually, there are practical situations in which you can make uh, action, you can do things to your standard, for instance, cleaning it, washing it, that has effects on its mass. And as we already uh, uh, seen, um, it is standard procedure to wash the IP key before using it. So, and washing it has an effect on, on its mass. I claim that this also puts relationalism in serious trouble. Um, so, to see that, suppose, suppose that you are in an initial situation where you have the IPK and one of its official copies, K1, that are perfectly equal. They are in the relation being as massive as R1. And imagine two possible uh, patterns. On the first, you clean IP, IPK. So this is the clause C. You clean it while the, the copy is stored under vacuum and uh, receives no source of influence whatsoever. Then after, you compare again the, the two and the IPK is found to be 99% as massive as K1. I mean, it's normal because washing and cleaning it uh, uh, removes some matter on its, on its surface, so it's, it's normal. On the second possible uh, scenario, uh, you, su you, you subject K1 to pollution, and we know that when there is too much mercury in the air, uh, there is a, a chemical reaction with the, the surface of the alloy, and some matter is stuck here, stuck here. While, uh, no, this should be IPK here. While the IPK is stored under uh, perfect conditions. Then you make a new comparison and you have the same result. Because now it's the copy who has gained in mass. Well, this is me, the absolute speaking, obviously. But from the relational point of view, the results, both results are the same. Okay. So, in, in both scenarii, the same, uh, the, the change in the relations is the same. But there are two distinct causal scenarii. Because the, cause, the causes are different. In one case we wash, in the other there is mercury pollution. So the question is how the relationalist could account for the fact that two different causes produce the same effect. This is not a problem as such. We can, think, we can think of two different causes that sort of converge to the same effect. But this is not as such the problem. First question, this change from a first relation to the second relation between the two objects, is this change ontologically uh, primitive or fundamental, not uh, reducible or analyzable in something more fundamental, or does it metaphysically depend on a change in at least one of its relata? I think this is a, 
two exclusive and uh, mutually exclusive uh, possibilities. In the first option, you have to think that the, the cause, be it C or P here, wash, uh, cleaning or pollution, you have to, to think that the cause directly acts on the relation itself, which is hard to, to conceive of, but just suppose that you can, you can make sense of it. So there is a cause who directly changes the mass relation between the two. Okay, maybe. In the, the second option, the cause acts on one of the two relata, therefore changing uh, its relation to the other. Okay, well, I will argue that the first option doesn't work and that we have to uh, choose the second. Well, first, it's hard to see how something can act on a relation. Relations are not anywhere, they're not between the object, they are, I, I don't know where, but a cause is uh, or acts locally. So, where is the relation that we, that that is acted upon, I don't know, but let's put that aside. If you are a relationist, you have, in this solution, in this first option, you have to remain blind as to which relator is acted upon. Because you assume that the relation directly acts on, uh, the cause directly acts on the relation. But this leads to absurd consequences. Because you could absolutely clean, instead of the IPK, you could clean the copy. So this is the same cause, but if you clean the other relator, well, the, re the resulting relation would be the opposite. The change would be from relation R1 to relation R1 to point, I don't know, 11, something like that. So uh, you, you would end up in a, in a situation where the same cause uh, causes two opposite effects. And this is uh, contrary to uh, determinism or something like that. So, the relationalist must turn to the second option in which a cause acts on one of the two relata and changes it in some way. Of course, you can be here absolutist and you can say that the cleaning, for instance, the cleaning acts on the absolute mass, mass of the IPK, changing it and therefore changing its mass relation. But if you are a relationist, you cannot say this. I think that your only way out would be to say that the cause acts on I don't know, another more fundamental property of the object on which its mass its relational mass uh, depends or supervene or is grounded, I don't know. But that would imply that mass is not a fundamental property, but it rather uh, supervene or depend on another aspect. This is what uh, Martins calls weak relationalism. You, you keep being a relationist about mass, but you admit that mass is not fundamental and is grounded maybe on another quantity which may be also relation on, on its part. But my answer would be that you should repeat the same argument on this new quantity which is more fundamental and so on. So I think that uh, the conclusion here is either that there are nothing fundamental and it's grounding uh, relation all the way on the way down, or that absolutism is right. Est-ce que j'ai encore un peu de temps? C'est fini. <laughs> bon. Alors, maybe we'll speak uh, about uh, constants, Planck's constant, and type-based definition in the Q&A. Thank you. Do you want uh, Fabien Wex? No? So, questions? Alexandre? I don't want to, to be unfair, but your relationist is very stupid. <laughs> okay? All the practice that you describe presume absolutism. 
Mm -hmm. All of them. None of them try to recount. Your relationist is a, some kind of relationist that is epistemological, but does not really believe in this ontological status of relation. The way you argue goes against you were exactly the same, by the way. So I understand how it could be complicated to to make sense of these practice for relationists, but but it's maybe not impossible. But you need a relationist that is more subtle. For example, when you say a relationist can tell if mass is a relation, relata should you should never talk about mass, even if in the relation. You should not even talk about massive property of the relata. Mm -hmm. Okay, your standard cannot be understood as a relator that is a standard. So you have to understand as the notion of standard in a completely different way if it's if it's related to a something in a box somewhere. And I would encourage you to, to look at uh, the the Stanford Encyclopedia uh, paper of Rovelli on on uh, on uh, 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 relative uh, no, uh, yeah the relational quantum mechanics. Not that it's quantum mechanics, but at least because in quantum mechanics, they try to make sense of what would be property of relation that are not connected to the relator by themselves. Mm -hmm. So in that case, when you make an argument, a relationist cannot say that about this relation. A relationist cannot say much, a lot of stuff about a single relation. You need another relation to talk about the property of the relation. Because a relation by itself, if you don't have access to the if it's not purely an effect of the relator, you cannot talk about it directly. You cannot say much mm -hmm. about three kilometers. I cannot say which one. Anymore. Is it a difference? Is it? No, it's just three kilometers. But with another relation, like a causal one or something else or whatever, I don't know. You can say something about this relation, but it's but it's. But it's not the same, because now you have two relations, so you cannot isolate hmm. the property of the relation from the fact that the kind of way you use to build another relation to talk about it. So, 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 and that, in, 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 if you start like that, I think you could avoid the obvious way an absolutist could say, but of course you're talking about relator. And it makes no sense for a relation if it's just relation are a derivative um, a derivative aspect of intrinsic properties absolute mm -hmm. but I but I see how the practices you're described the practices to keep something in the box it's clearly uh, they presume absolutist by default yeah by default that's the that's the standard way to understand the practice but if, if you're serious about, okay, mass is a relation, I'm not sure it's a good idea, I'm just saying, someone would really like to defend mass as relation, it's exactly like, how do you define a relation in monads? You know, it's not, it's not just looking at relata, it's complicated. I know. So it's a suggestion, it's not yeah, an objection. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I understood. But I don't see how I could apply it in this literature, uh, I could try. It could be, it could be. But, I don't, but I don't that's why to. I ask you, what, what do they mean when they say a quantity is a relation? But what do they mean metaphysically about that kind of relation? Is it just epistemological? Is the way we measure quantity? No. Or are, we say, are they saying something, a mass is a relation? What do they mean metaphysically? Well, you, you won't find this kind of sentence, mass is relation. But you will find that uh, sentences like, there are only mass relations, or sometimes mass ratios, even if it's not meaningful to speak of ratios without. Yeah, ratio. Yeah, ratio to, <laughs> but sometimes. Yeah, uh, ratio is an absolute. Today, relationist speaks of, uh, speak of mass ratios, which is weird. Okay, okay. But I don't want uh, to make a case about it. But so, Relationism about quantity today, maybe they are idiots. <laughs> I don't think no, they no, are. No, no, but maybe they are epistemological. No, no, they are not. It's pure ontology. Oh. Yeah, yeah. They have epistemological arguments. Uh, Descartes, for instance, says that 
Well, in measurement practice, we only access to comparison, is it? so relations. So, uh, absolute masses are not uh, accessible. So we should get rid of it because uh, in virtue of some economic principle or thing, things like that. Okay. But there are only mass relations among complete okay, objects. Let, 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 let's try to take an easier case. So if you see that distance is purely relational, so it makes no sense to talk about position at all. Position is always a relation. Um, and you would say, okay, I want to operationalize the notion of position, so I need something like a standard of distance. But I, I, there's no relata. Okay? These relata makes no sense because position do not exist. Only relations, mm -hmm. spatial relations. No, Leibniz. If you want to be a relationist about distance, you won't need positions. You will need. Uh, you will say that you are. You you have space intervals, mm -hmm. which are the relators here, and that space intervals stand in distance relation. In a yeah, in distance relation. Not that they are distant which, with each other, but that. But when I will build my standard, do, do I? I, I will have the same problems, according to you. The same four arguments should work, should go against. If you are a, a, a relationist that is not really a relationist, but if you are a pure relationist, if you see, I guess that's you could, it. You that's could it. Say distance, yeah. distance makes no sense whatsoever. I guess what outside of two two things. You could say, for instance, Without that your your relationist standard could be. The relation between the this distance, this length, and maybe the length between the Earth and the Sun. So you have two space intervals. Okay. And your standard would be the distance relation, not the distance between the two, but the distance, the length relation between the two, if you want. If you want. But I don't know if, and this is maybe, maybe the question, if you could use uh, a relation as a standard or maybe not use, but reconstruct the whole uh, theory of length using this as a basic element, maybe. I don't know. Okay. There is obviously a, a drawback in this, it, which is that in practice you attribute uh, measurements result to objects, not to relations. So. But that, that's the weird part of our relations. <laughs> they have to buy a lot of new metaphysics. Because relation will not be just conversion of intrinsic property of objects. They buy that there's such a thing as something ontological in the relation that is not in either of the relator. That's be a relationist, a service relationist. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a good idea, but. It's what they try to argue, at least. But I don't think that the, the relationist uh, opponent here is that stupid. But it, 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 your arguments are pretty obvious when you think about it. Mm -hmm. so, 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 no, no, but they are extremely well designed, but they should have fun. <laughs> this, the relationists you're describing have been around for a certain time, they should be. I cannot see that they didn't see the kind of arguments you proposed. They see, yeah. I don't say obvious, they are obvious after you explain it yeah. to me, of course, not but before, but if I pass my life about standard and relations and I defend relationism, I should be able to, <laughs> to resist the washing and the asymmetry of causality. That's something I should have thought. Well, but to just to, to to draw the picture here, uh, the actually most discussed argument against relationism is the escape velocity argument from Baker, I think, Baker, uh, which sa uh, who says that we need absolute mass magnitudes in certain cases to explain, uh, in the Newton Newtonian gravity, to explain uh, why a body who is revolving around a big massive object can ex escape or not. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. uh, for instance, 
you have been, you only have two bodies in the universe, the satel satellites and Earth, say. Uh, if you just have the mass relation between the two and no absolute magnitude on both of them, uh, on one case, the satellite wouldn't es escape, but if you double the masses, uh, the relation is the same, but the effect would be different. Maybe the satellite would crash or escape, or so there there are dynamical difference differences, while the relations are not the same. So this is the same relation is that I took here as an opponent, but I. I stuck his nose or her nose on the practices and I don't think that we need to invent a very clever uh, metaphysical fic fic fictional situation to to, uh, to criticize it. Okay. Yeah. Other questions? Can I Go to front or up or whatever, like Alexandre say. Like for your far argument, I just the first one is quite more or less explicit. They look like versions of transcendental arguments in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, for the meaning of stuff, you don't really need that. But if I'm a relationist, for these kind of uh, situations, I think like the, there is a very well, okay. there is a easy way to use uh, strong strategies against uh, transcendental arguments to escape. Uh, your argument and say, well, I just need to believe that there is a fixed point. It's not that it exists, but just a useful uh, fiction that I use as a way to fix uh, stuff epistemologically speaking. But it doesn't mean that the metaphysical limit, but it translates metaphysically to uh, what exists in the world. Okay. And see, but mo most arguments here yeah, could be uh, could be very bad. Okay, that's a nice uh, advice. Well, partly it is an advice that I should not say that it is a transcendental argument. <laughs> no, <laughs> I didn't yeah, say it, so I... The structure is very similar. Yeah. But in order to avoid this kind of answer, maybe I shouldn't... I keep... I should keep on not saying it. <laughs> and... Um, partly, maybe... I don't know. It's you, it's you to tell me. Um, Did I put it here? Is this assumption, realist assumption, uh, compatible with your Strasonian uh, move or not? That's the sort of strong balance. This is the assumption that objects objectively or really have magnitude, whether these magnitudes are relational or absolute. And this also applies to your standard. So when you say that it is fixed, that it is stable, you are saying something about something is real, something real, yes. not just a, fi a fiction. So. You are saying something about the way you understand that what is real, what is fixed. I mean, mm. because the, the, the first argument, if I understand correctly, the principle of fixity was there to uh, avoid you being uh, able to say, well, I don't know which one has changed, mm -hmm. but. Uh, it's a question of uh, epistemology and belief of which yeah. one has changed. It's not a question of which one has actually changed the world, right? So you, you claim the right to make as if one changes and the other. Like I mentioned, you think that one, uh, you think that uh, one is uh, fixed, and that's the way to go like, okay. change. This is uh, maybe close to what Ding <coughs> said. Ding is yeah. not okay. very famous, but he said. Uh, in a paper that we have to include the stability aspect in the scaling convention, in the choice of the standard, because in this way we have no ambiguity problem when we measure things. Maybe that my uh, balance is not right, yeah. maybe that the IPK has gained in mass during my, the holiday, but I've eaten a lot of cakes and I have less weight. Okay, this is anonymous, so it's good. I mean, it's just, yes, I'm just saying it's, it's a way that the relations could not something like that. Yeah. Okay. And another thing, if I may just continue. Another thing, uh, 
one of the thing uh, I was uh, not that was with that I found a bit weird maybe was about the identity of the IPK because at, so there are different uh, parts of your talk. One which was against uh, when you talk about the APK in, uh, in, 1980, in 1889 being the same as the one in 1989. Sure, you have the same identity, but the, does the identity include the mass of it? Can you can your object it's, it's, it can keep its identity, so you can say it's the same object, but the mass would have changed and uh, mm -hmm. keep it keep its changing identity in this way. So it's not an issue. I don't see why you couldn't why you have to use a premise B. No. Premise B seems to be a bit too strong. Pre premise B in the oh, yeah. it seems to be like too strong of uh, an assumption. Well, at least the way you use it is. I said that it was the same object yeah. while allowing its properties to change. Yes, but in the argument afterward, you uh, uh -huh. use the fact that yeah. they have a they have a they have a should have a same mass. Yeah. Because there is this temptation to consider the two as two distinct objects. And if you do that, you actually have to, to choose one as the standard. I think that the most natural way to go would be to choose the IGK in 1980. Uh, no, it should be in 80. Uh, no, yes. To choose this one, the first. Uh, IPK at the time when it was manufactured, mm -hmm. to choose this as the standard. But this would imply uh, a big revision of all the XI brochures, <laughs> of all the definitions, because, because now you have to say that the unit of mass is the mass of this object which does not exist anymore. Yeah. And you would have to conceive of your mass measurements as comparisons with a past object. Isn't, isn't that ex exactly what we're doing in practice? I mean, up until the change of uh, yeah. definition of units? Mm -hmm. I think that this, indeed, I, I didn't put it in the slide, but, and I, I hesitated to put it in the paper, but this is not a good way, but a coherent way to be relationalist. It would be to say that this past object, which does not exist anymore, is your standard. And obviously it cannot change because it is a, a point event, maybe. So it cannot change, it is uh, trivially fixed. And to reformulate the postulate of fixity by saying something which is not trivial, is to say that the IPA now, or the, the object that now we call the IPA, is in the relation as being as massive as the best object. Mm -hmm. But this is really not uh, verifiable. Mm -hmm. this is yeah. Yeah, it's, it is coherent, I think. Okay. And the same I tried to, to, to find uh, weak, weak spots on this, but I didn't. So. Well, and the other question of identity was about when you are talking about the uh, washing stuff? About what? Washing uh, uh, so you have to wash the stuff, uh, the, the PK standard. But what you, what you wash is like, you, the mass you take, you're taking away is not supposed to be the mass of the PK, you're taking away the mass of the dust that's on the PK. Yeah. You said yourself it's a mass on the surface, so it's not supposed to be part of the definition of the PK. So you're not well, changing the mass of the PK when you're doing that. The metrologist uh, hesitated what, when they realized that the, the unit of mass is the mass of the IPK after being cleaned and washed. They hesitated whether they should uh, modify the definition or not, because it is yeah. a matter of uh, designation. And they choose not to modify the definition, but only to add uh, a rule. Okay. To add as a rule that uh, it is only to be used after being washed and cleaned. But it's only because they are precautions and we could uh, we could imagine non precautionist non precautionist mm -hmm. uh, metrologists who have who have a uh, varying standard mm -hmm. and the, the argument applies. Um, yeah. Okay. And it's very bizarre because uh, when you see the, the curve, 
the IPK loses lots of mass in uh, one or two or three cleaning procedures and gain it again in a few months. And you, you, you can see the curve, it's really strange. In maybe six months, it has gained all that has been washed up. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Is she in vacuum? Yeah. No, it's not in vacuum, it's okay. ambient air. Okay. Other questions? Do you only consider the memory in physics? I know that the memory in economics is very different because there, there are no stable fixed point in economics. And when I talk about the criteria economics, it's always very flexible. I, even though I don't have any examples, <laughs> how do you think about your your idea? Is only based on physics, or consider all measurement in science? Yeah, um, there is. Uh, this is an important question as to should we admit of quantities outside the natural realm? Or what uh, counts as quantity or not? And um, but they are opposite sides, obviously, and in the human or social sciences, I would tend to say that there are no quantity at all. So, yeah, maybe if you give me an example of a quantity in economy, uh, I don't know, maybe... Um, inflation, PB. Inflation, PB, quantity, gross... Uh, Measure gross products, uh, domestic, domestic, <laughs> domestic <laughs> products. Of oh, the measures of happiness. <laughs> <laughs> index of happiness? There's a lot of work on these indexes. But do these quantities have units, for instance? Mm -hmm. This is the main question. Uh, you, 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 and in, in economy, the yeah, economists uh, always try to translate a uh, sentence about prices, about growth, about inflation in real value, right? Real income, real blah blah and does does uh, do, do these real quantities have units? I, I don't know. Isn't money got a unit in this sense? Hmm? Isn't money got a unit in this sense? Money? Like a dollar or yeah but in econo in economy theory you don't have money. You don't even have zero. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean you could try to you could try to fake it and say that like the 1990 US dollar is like the the unit of value, but when, when I, I suspect even economists would say like that's some kind of fiction, right? That that's some kind of, it's just it's like a helpful yeah. way to calculate. So, so it's not not really most of the time in the well, economical theory, you talk about value, yeah. you don't even talk about money. You talk about right. values yeah, which are defined through the market. So it's right. not that clear. What is the unit there? But when you were bought with uh, domestic growth, you bought the value in, in dollar. Yes. Uh, yeah. And the dollar that is fixed to uh, but it's not, but it's, positions. But it's not mostly not in chemical theory. No, no you have to, to quotient it, you know, take the money away to measure real uh, value yeah. growth. So, yeah, I don't know. I don't have the answer to your question. Yeah, thanks. I also don't know. <laughs> Other questions? I want to take the place, but the escape argument does not work, I will ask you. <laughs> <laughs> if there's only two, two objects in the universe, you, s you have, okay, so you have, they are turning or escape. If the, uh, they escape, you cannot say which one escape because both of them become to have inertial movement at the same time. The argument would say, oh yeah, but if I put mass on the more mass on the big one, nothing happened. If I put more mass on the small one, suddenly mm -hmm. I can have escape or not. But that makes no sense from a relational mm -hmm. point of view. You cannot say I put more mass on the big one or the small one. So you already presume absolutism in the argument. So show me the argument, and if it's that dumb, we'll have a paper against it. <laughs> okay, I will send it to you, but I don't want to, to write uh, 
a relation is paper written. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's to improve the, uh, the, the, the absolutist yes. that already are winning, I'm sure. Because yeah. again, this is, I mean, this is, in some sense, it's, a, it's, it's, it's got a lot of echoes of the uh, subtitleism about space time arguments, right? Where you have to take the move that says, if you're going to make it go through, you have to take the move that says your mistake is in thinking that those are actually two different possible worlds, but they're not. Even though they seem like they should be, they actually aren't. Which is a very, and I mean, that's just a, it strikes me that that's part of what makes this whole thing kind of difficult, is that maybe somewhere in the background, a really dedicated relationist is going to make some similar kinds of moves in some of these cases and say, you know, look, what, what you've actually done wrong is you think you've described two different states of the world. And like they sound like they are, and they seem like they are, but in fact, you failed to describe two metaphysically distinct possible worlds. You've just described the same possible world two times with different words, which is, and I mean, that's always. What, what I, I just, I've always found those arguments hard. I, I, I mean, I wrote my, I wrote my bachelor thesis on theories of space time. <laughs> so like, I've thought about this. I spent like a year thinking about like nothing but this for a year. Um, and I just found, I mean, I have, I have a hard time because it's, it's really weird. It's hard to have intuitions about that, right? It's very hard to have intuitions about, but I do think it's two different possible worlds, but I don't think it's two different possible worlds. Like, what, what even, like, how do we, how do we push back on that? I've, I've never had a very good answer for, like, if that's what someone's response to you is, right? No, you, 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 think, you've, you think you've forced me into a bind, but actually you failed to distinguish two different states of the universe. Like, I don't even know what you what you should say to them if they tell you that, right? Well, the, <laughs> the, the gist of Baker's argument would be that we could make this this, this distinction by I don't know, exhibiting gravitational effects, mm. right? A difference in gravitational effects. Um, in the last part of the paper, I have a similar argument. That they, um, it's known as the doubling argument. Because if you double all the masses in the universe, oh yeah, the relations stay the same, but you have two different situations, and yeah, the relation is just answers. Uh, well, no, they are not two different situations. Oh yeah, they, it is. It's, 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 it's just it's your intuition better. speaking. Huh. So you have to to answer to this. I think no, it's not my intuition. Mm -hmm. uh, and just mm -hmm. not only intuit that those are two different uh, situations, but. I know because I can make this difference by showing potential gravitational effects. Mm -hmm. Or in the last part of the paper, I, I consider that the kilogram be defined with reference to the Planck's constant. And suppose that the Planck's constant suddenly changes. And then you will have uh, more than a dynamical effect, but a metrical effect to make the distinction between the two situations because um, a shift in the Planck's constant would preserve all the mass relations among objects, but changing other stuff. Not directly their masses maybe, but the masses that you measure through the cable balance or something like that. So Well, and then you run into all the kinds of stuff that it's not worse on about Changing, I mean, changing fundamental constants feels a lot like changing laws. Yes, yeah, exactly. It's, 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 gonna, it's gonna have all the same so kinds what, of implications. What is, what is really interesting about now that they use constant is that you connect a lot more stuff. Mm -hmm. So if you change something here, you say, oh yeah, but I will, to compensate exactly, I have to change more and more stuff around. Yeah. So it's, it's... Like if we're wrong about the value of C, like that would be really weird because that shows up everywhere. <laughs> like that would, yeah. But if you base it on the Planck constant, it's interesting because if your mass ratio is related to the the lambda the Planck constant, blah blah blah. But Planck constant appear in other kind of physics, other kind, other kind of non-just mass or non-just. So mm -hmm. so you could say, oh, okay, if change here, I don't see an effect, but I see an effect there. Mm -hmm. I would know. That maybe it's the blanket or something else, but still. So so it's more and more a holist conception of units. So at the end, everything works or nothing works. Yeah. Yeah, you could, for instance, say that uh, 
if the Planck's constant changes, your mass measurement won't change, but your, I don't know, frequency, frequency measurement mm -hmm. changes mm -hmm. because frequency and uh, Compton frequency and mass are tied up in the definition. So. You don't have time to get here, but I just in 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 like thirty seconds. How do you how do you do that? How do you integrate that into the view that you present here? Because you were saying that you you wanted when you were talking about standards, you were talking about standards as like stuff, like those are concreta. Do you want to say that then like Planck's constant becomes one of those? No, no. So you want to talk about but you mentioned you mentioned like you have to make this, then you have to fabricate standards. So yeah, how does that how does that work? Just give me give me give me that in thirty seconds, just because I'm interested. Well, you have a cable balance, which ties uh, ties um, a body with its mass to some electronic uh, quantum effects here, ah, and okay. you just have it's not a law actually, but it's an equation um, which is made of different equations. You have an equation that is uh, relating the mass here and the frequency of the, the body through the Planck's constant, basically, very basically. So uh, you can just fix the value of the Planck constant and say that the kilogram is the mass of a body with such frequency or such frequency, basically. Cool. So you could make a perfectly material standard. I want to read about how that balance works now. That's yeah. actually super cool. Yeah. That's ingenious as heck. That's a lot of debate uh, as to is this really a sound relation between mass and Planck's mm -hmm. constant? Because this is not the same type of relation that we could call a law or, so, or, a law or something like that. This is really uh, handmade. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's one thing when it's the speed of the speed of light yeah. in a meter, because I mean, in theory, that's just so some mirrors and move them until you get the interference right. Like, cool, no big deal. But yeah, yeah, that sounds a lot more complicated than that. <laughs> that's cool. Can I just have like a really naive question because I don't follow this discussion a lot? So, uh, could you just say that? The standards that we have now, so meter, kilogram, seconds, are always defined relational to one another, or no? Or no? The different standards of different quantities? Yeah. So just the, the meter, as far as I understand, meter is defined as uh, the duration, no, the, the length of speed of light in, in one yeah. second, right? Yeah. Uh, or it was zero point something seconds, I don't know. It's something like that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the new one. Yeah, in one, yeah, yeah, of a second, right? Right. And then the second is defined as. Uh, oh, it's not here. Yeah, but you had it somewhere. It's like the, the radiate, the dedicated radio, radioactive decay, right? Mm -hmm. So what if you could just, what if you just claimed uh, that? You, you can't define these, these units without uh, uh, other units. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And this it, is. It wouldn't be like a claim, you know, that's uh, you know, completely relational, you know, but, but, no. but just that the units are always relational. Because I was thinking. Uh, uh, I don't know, and I don't know anything about physics. But if you have the, the radi radioactive decay of the of the cesium atom, right? Uh, the frequency, right? Uh, is this like with gravity? Is it in zero gravity? When does it like? Does the gravity actually affect, uh, mm -hmm. affect the frequency or not? I don't know, but like if it does, uh, then but it's then it's always then it's always a bit will be wobbly. There is an extensive uh, literature on. The fact that with the new uh, international system of units, um, units, are, we wouldn't say that they are relational between them because uh, they are different quantities. So if they have relations, it's anomic relations, maybe. But there is an extensive literature on the fact that now they are codependent and they are not defined independently one to an, of another. So. When the units were uh, were defined with directly reference with 
material objects, they, are, they were perfectly uh, independent, but now, with definitions based on laws, laws of nature, uh, well, if you take the example of the matter, you cannot independently define the matter on one hand and uh, the second on the other, because what you are actually referring to as a fixed point is a speed. So, mm -hmm. uh, you should, yes. And that's, that's why in the new SI, new System International, uh, I love that in measurement literature I can speak in French, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> in the System International, um, so units are not defined independently, but based on seven defining constants. So you just have a base of seven independent fixed points, and on that, on that you have seven codependent uh, definitions. Yeah. Well, maybe the, the second actually is more independent than the, than the others, but this is an exception because it's not actually defined uh, with reference to a constant. But, yeah. but, but are they a bit circular or not? If they're codependent? Mm -hmm. It just there smells circular. Right? No, there is no. Uh, this is holistic, but this is not circular because you have seven fixed points. So with seven fixed points, you can define uh, sufficiently seven other things, right? I saw that the practice that you would define if stuff with they are different, so they just uh, like they, they uh, increase the coherence and the confidence in the whole net because you have different practices and you need different definition. But it's circular in the sense that it could it's, it's matter defined this and, blah, 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 and it could be, you could make a circle, but you test the complete yeah. system at the same time. Yes. As so a whole, it's, it's all coherent. goes okay, or it's all failure. Yeah, I'm not saying it's not coherent, but like it, it's impossible to actually define them independently. And you know, you know the meter example, right? You can't just define it as, as you know that stick in France. That, that's also not exactly scientific. Well, it was, for but that was that's yeah, a choice. You know, they were not forced. To def the new yeah. system was a choice, so they made some choice. They decided to do that. The um, the bad consequence of these new forms of definition is that you cannot now measure the these yeah. constants. You cannot because their value are conventionally conventionally fixed. So, so if C changed, if C changed it, we, we wouldn't be able to see it, except if, uh, if they are, I don't know, super weird, uh, <laughs> at, the, at the verge of the uh, metrologist community, a very resistant little group who keeps on measuring lengths with the, bo the metal bar, keeps on measuring masses with the IPK, and then maybe they could with using uh, cable balances, measure uh, variation in H in the flux constant. Well, that was, I, was, I, was, I was shocked when you put up that quote there. I mean, it, it's the kind of thing, you don't realize how circular it seems until you point out that it's circular. When they say that the, the mass of the IPK changed by 50 nanograms or something, and you're like, wait. <laughs> I mean, if, if obviously now by the new definition we're allowed, we, 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 we might be allowed to say that. But I mean, it is it is very interesting, uh, and that's one thing I, I I I mean I really like that argument. That it's just it's metaphysically impossible to say that on the old definition. That's literally nonsense. No, well, yeah. maybe it's not nonsense, but epistemologically, there is strictly speaking a circularity that forbids mm -hmm. you to to conclude mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this statement. But there are statistical causal reasoning that could allow you to, with prudence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very carefully. Yeah, very but carefully. how could you say it's metaphysically nonsense? Because it's compared to the one in the past, to which we have no access, but still exists <sighs> yeah. as a past fact. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we cannot check it, that's true, but it's not metaphysically nonsense. It's just non accessible. It's.
It's metaphysically nonsense if you don't start putting indexes on every time you yeah, use the yeah, word that's brand. True. Okay, okay, fair enough. Right. Fair that's enough. what you. That's yeah, yeah. Okay, fair. If you do, if you do, you know, G sub <laughs> nineteen fifty, and then G sub twenty ten, or whatever. Yeah, okay. Okay. Then you're then yeah then you're then you're clear, but yeah, then you wind up in the problem you say. What the heck is a G1950? We have no idea what a G1950 is. <laughs> That's useless. But metaphysicians do not care that it's useless. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're right, you're right, you're right. No, that's a fair point. That's a very fair point. That's a fair point. Okay. Any more questions? No? I think it's almost done anyway. Yeah, beer time. Beer time. Beer time. Thank you. Thank you.